In today's video, we are going to discuss why this is how Chelsea can beat Brighton this weekend at Stamford Bridge. On the left here, you can see the team that I would play against Brighton this weekend. Just the one change from the team that beat West Ham with Tossin unfortunately losing his spot in the lineup. Fafana going back to right centre back and Gusto coming back into the team at right back. On the right, you can see what the build up shape could look like during this game, and we're going to discuss why now in the live section. Just before we get into the live bit of analysis, this is the team and the build up that Chelsea used against Inter Milan in pre season with that diamond shape. And here is the Manchester United 3 1 6 that they used building out from the back against Brighton in their 2 1 loss. Take both of these systems into account during the live section as I think a mesh of both of these build-up shapes could be how Chelsea beat Brighton at the weekend. Okay, let's get into the analysis part of this video. So, as I've sort of tried to show you already, the pressing lines of this Brighton team will more or less look like a 4-4-2. Like so. I'll try and flash them in, images up on screen or ones I've already showed you. If you've got that 4-4-2... What you're often going to see for Brighton is the staggered two up front. So you've got one, the actual striker pushing between these two centre-backs. The sort of number 10 or secondary striker dropping off. So they're staggered. Then you do the same in the midfield where one will sit deeper, one will sit more advanced. So again, a staggered midfield in the press. And you've got the two wingers. who Again, they're going to just sit fairly narrow, try and cut off the pitch in that 4-4-2. Then, again, with the back four, you'll probably see it a little bit narrower than this. And then, obviously, again, a little bit higher up um, in the first phases of pressure. But the the aim is the same. It's to stay in that 4-4-2 and sort of provide stability throughout the full Brighton and in their press to apply pressure on the ball, but to still stay compact in central areas and force teams on the outside, again, staying narrow with that back four. So how can Chelsea play against this and why do I think it could be a somewhat of a return for the diamond formation that we've spoke about? That people were very happy about that and how that went. And I did say at the time it was purely we used that diamond against Inter because it worked to play around their press and how they played with that back five with the three in midfield and the two strikers. Now with this, it's not quite the same. It's the same principles as the diamond that I'm going to be describing but not quite the same. So what I would say is to go around this Brighton press and how I think Chelsea can beat this Brighton press is they're still going to that three at the back. And I'll try and flash up on the screen now. Man United did this and even at times Forest playing that 3-1-6 to play through Brighton's lines because what they usually do, in Augusto for a minute, if you're playing with that three and that one, is this player will be pressing sort of towards Colwell say Cole's on the ball that's his man this man is he's in close proximity so he can also press here but he can also sort of cover this player in the box so his positioning is to cover two men then if the ball goes out to here you can cover sorry if you can hear the dog barking by the way goes out to Kukurea he can press there if it goes out the other way then what would often happen is again you could see that happen where one presses out the other one covers but again this leaves Casado quite free in the hole so what you'd have to do and they'd have to sort of drop off to find this the other way of doing it which we could see and which has happened again at points of season is this player jumps out onto Fafana so here's where I'm going to sort of talk about a little bit of what the diamond could look like if Gusto is inverting in around this zone he's taking this man He's now pinning to that man. He's hoping that that man attaches to him. Fafana's now got time on the ball. This man then has to get over to Fafana. And this is just already causing a lot for these two men to do. Again, without this player jumping out, which they will do at times. This is where Enzo comes in. This is where Gusto come in. Because again, you're seeing this sort of three. Palmer's going to be further out of the equation. So almost like the three, three, four that we speak about a lot. And that's why it's sort of related to the diamond in the sense of when Palmer drifts in, you could see this sort of midfield. And it depends. Sometimes Gusto might come narrower, Enzo might push on, and it could look more of like the usual box that you see. But the idea is the same. is to drag these players out of position. 
It's to make it hard for these players for, with these distances in the middle. Because then if this player has to jump up to Casado, if they can beat this first two-man press, which is staggered, all of a sudden, lots of space in here to receive. Jackson can pull out. And again, this happened against Forrest, where one of the strikers pushed in. They got followed. And then again, loads of space here. So there's always going to be ways that you can sort of manipulate the press to find your way into space. And Chelsea working up in this sort of 3-3-4 three, three, or somewhat like this, making it hard for making it, making this gap bigger. This player then has to either stay with Palmer or if he's worried about, say, the ball goes out here and he ends up having to press, Palmer's in space. So the idea again is to overload that midfield, these two, especially in the centre, have a lot to sort of focus on with the middle three. Gusto is occupied here. So that also means if Gusto can bring this man inside, that passes on for Fafana straight into Madueke. You can isolate this man 1v1. And again, that's something you can start to do throughout the game. And if that is what is working, if they are coming inside with Gusto, that pass is what's going to be on all game. If they're not coming inside with Gusto and they stay in here, and they're, then again, you have the overload here with Gusto. You can pop it into Gusto, pop it around to Casado, and you're going to end up with an overload there instead. So that with Gusto's positioning sort of being closer and then drifting inward to try and drag this man across, you're giving the opposition a sort of lose-lose situation in the sense that you're always going to be able to find the spare man after that point. The other thing to note is that with usually one of the higher midfield players pressing on, say say that this one, it, the ball's gone to Enzo, this midfield is pressed on here, this midfield is trying to stay deeper. If this midfielder hasn't dropped in, and these guys are still trying to, and they're in these passing lanes, they don't want the ball to go out into these zones. And again, that middle of the pitch is for the taking. Chelsea got a free man here to bounce the ball. Jackson, who can drop in deep. Palmer's dragging this man. So again, if if they want to stop Jackson, Jackson they're going to have to jump out. There's going to be a lot of space in here. So I think the way to go around this game is sort of in that 3-3-4, three, three, but having it so Enzo can drop in deep. Gusto can start wide to come inside late. And you can still see that 3-1 pattern, this sort of four, that Manchester United did really effectively against Brighton. Yes, they lost, but the build-up did look effective, which is the main reason I've sort of spoke about this build-up today is because I watched that game and I watched it back again. And I think the build-up structure that they went with was actually quite effective when it worked, like when they actually played through the press in terms of splitting these two and splitting these two. Because I think if you can split those two lines because they are going to stagger. If you can split them enough, then there's plenty of space to play through by Brighton. And then with that back four, they're going to try and be narrow. Like I said, there's a lot of times where you can try to get on to that back four, stretch them, uh, sorry, pin them narrow, and then you can get the ball out to these wingers who can create down the flanks. So there's plenty of ways to beat this Brighton team. If I had to put my money on who's going to be the most important in this game, from a tactical perspective, I'm keeping an eye on Gusto. Like I say, tactically, I want to see what he does. There's a chance he could do it from the other side with Kukurea at times as well to try and pin both. But again, that sort of leaves you with um, this overload. So then that would sort of see Casado having to drop in here. And then there'd be a few too many people out of positions because of the like that would still leave a 2v2 in that deeper line of pressure. So I don't see it happening on both sides. But... I would like to see Colwell back in the central centre-back position to, again, be trying to find those passes into Casado, into Enzo, into Jackson. So I do definitely think the most important in this game, let's say Gusto from a tactical perspective, let's say Jackson from a space perspective. I think he's going to get a lot of the ball in this area here, especially if he's attached to someone like Van Hecker, who's going to come into these zones like he did against Nottingham Forest, and then he can spin off in behind. And then I'm going to say Madueke as well out wide because I think if Gusto can drag his man inside, Fafana can get that ball into Madueke and he can really isolate their left back, which would probably be best to Pinyan as much as possible and get some joy down that side. So let's hope that the game plans out something like this. This is what I'm expecting to see. Could it be something else? Absolutely. Mariska always has something up its sleeve. Like I say, there's plenty of ways to go around a 4 4 2 press. It's just that the Manchester United game, I think, especially in the first half against Brighton, was sort of the blueprint of how to build up against that 
those lines of pressure. And again, against Nottingham Forest, I think they did the same thing in the little sustained pres- uh, pressure and possession that they managed to have in that game. So let's see how the game goes. We'll be reviewing the game on Monday or Sunday, maybe Monday, one of the two. There'll be a video out on the channel to describe what happened in the game, see how much of this was correct. Even if it looks slightly different on the pitch in terms of the build-up patterns and the play, let's see how much of it comes down to a few of the things that I've mentioned. And we will speak more about that on Sunday or Monday. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. Let me know down below who you think are going to be the most important players in this game. Drop a like if you haven't already and subscribe.